Today, we have an interview with Big Jim from BigJimsWalk.com. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is going to be a testimony edition, and this is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. My passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Today, we have a testimony interview with Big Jim from BigJimsWalk.com. You're going to hear a testimony of a man that Jesus brought out of 34 years of addiction. Jim's tests and Jim's trials and how tragedy sparked a turning point in his life to take some serious ground for Jesus. You're going to hear what I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to apologize a little bit for the audio quality because it's taken from a Facebook Live interview, but you can hear you can hear it. So it's going to rock for Jesus. Without further ado, here is the interview with Big Jim from BigJimsWalk.com. We are happy coffee with Conrad. Hey everybody, it's Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. My passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. And I have an interview today with Jim Downs, Big Jim from BigJimsWalk.com. i got to figure out how to get him on here. Anyway, he has a testimony from addiction to Jesus to on-fire evangelist. Yeah, let's get him in here. Hey, how's it going? What's going on, brother? Well, I am uh, excited to be here. I'm excited about tonight, and I can't thank you enough for inviting inviting me to come on uh, and, and speak with you and all your followers. Amen. Hey, you had a little bit of warfare yesterday. You feeling good? Uh, you know, name, right? hey, man, I, I, I made it through the day today, and it was all because of him. Uh, I almost fell a few times the day before, and, uh, hey, uh, I'm, I'm here. It's a blessing. Amen. Well, let's pray in, and then let's get to it, okay? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the transformation, Lord, that you did in Jim's life, Big Jim. Lord, I thank you for his passion to bring your kingdom on the earth and transform lives like his has been transformed. Lord, I pray during this interview, Lord, that you're a shield about us. We know that you are. I pray that no no weapon formed against us shall prosper in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Lord, I pray for the keys, the keys to unlock people's problems, Lord. And and uh Lord, I pray for the people that are watching this interview or listening to this podcast after the show. Lord, I pray that something clicks with them. There's a, a, I see like a prison door and something that we say will be the key, Lord. I pray for the keys for the kingdom that you give every believer, Lord. I pray for that to manifest itself tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hey, Jenny. Good to see you. Jenny Reese Clark is on here, man. She's the reason I have you on here. Jenny, She's got Jenny. an amazing testimony, too. Yes, she does. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Jenny over the phone while I was on the walk. Uh, a, uh, it was amazing because uh, her and her husband both, through a state trooper we were having conversation with, called Jenny and said, hey. You, we, we got to pray with for this guy right here. He's doing this. And that's how we've met Jenny, and uh, she's been a blessing to our life ever since. So, hey, Jenny, how you doing? Amen. Yeah, you guys be sure and check her out. She, uh, I, I have her, she's got her testimony pretty much everywhere, but you can friend her. She's in the comments. And I, I have her, one of her early testimonies, I think, on conradrocks.net. Uh, but anyway, it's an, uh, it's an awesome story. So, Jim, we're here for you, brother. What? How bad was it, and how has Jesus changed your life, and what, what mission are you on right now? <laughs> uh, well, uh, how bad was it? 
Uh, 34 years of addiction. I was Satan's general. Uh, I, I mean, we're talking about... Uh, I, I I can't believe the life that I did leave, uh, that I lived. Um, it, it was bad. I mean, at the age of uh, at the age of eleven, I started smoking cigarettes. Twelve, I was drinking and smoking dope, and at fourteen, I'm doing meth, and I gravitated to the dark side quickly. And uh, it, it um, but I've got to go back because it, I, I want to share this right off the get. Generational curses are real, and uh, I'm a I'm a billboard of proof about that. Uh, I was adopted into a family. I was given up at birth, um, and and the devil immediately recognized that. And he put a seed, he planted a seed in me of abandonment. And that seed of abandonment uh, was watered and fertilized by him. And he really, and, and it was just one thing after another in my life. My father that adopted me died when I was three. Uh, my mother didn't want any more children. They already had three daughters. They didn't want, she didn't want to have any more kids. Uh, she didn't know what to do with uh, of the boy that they adopted. Uh, and so she was very distant from me. A loving family, no drugs, no alcohol, middle class, uh, no stepping out, no crazy stuff, but there was no Jesus. There was no God in the family. Um, and, uh, uh, she, you know, she didn't know what to do with a boy that she really didn't want in the first place. I was wanted by my father that died at when I was three. Uh, so they compromised and adopted. But, uh, uh, that abandonment, boom, there it is again. You know, my mother being distant from me, boom, there it is again. Uh, she remarried uh, two years later to uh, a man that already had four boys that were, the youngest one was 15 years older than me. Uh, so he wasn't interested in raising another child. Boom, there's another, you know, let's just keep fertilizing that abandonment. Uh, so, uh, you know, the spirit of addiction took over at a very young age. And, uh, you know, I, there was, how can you describe hate and anger? And, uh, I became a bully. Uh, you know, I'm a big guy and, you know, I hurt people if I wanted to, I hurt people because I was asked to. Uh, you know, if you've heard of a tax collector before, that's what I was. I've done some pretty nasty and dirty things before in my life. Uh, once again, I, I, I had no God in my life, no Jesus, no Bible. I didn't believe. As a matter of fact, I hated. Uh, I, I didn't believe in the Bible, didn't believe in the Word, didn't believe in Jesus. I told everyone, y'all are just stupid. You know, it's all fairy tales, it's just stories, and, uh, you know, it, uh, it, 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 and the more, it seemed the more that I, that I said that, the more I wanted to reinforce that God wasn't real and prove that God wasn't real. Uh, I went through five marriages, Conrad, five marriages. What? Wow. Five marriages. Uh, that, uh, that is that, uh, spirit of addiction, that addiction that had a hold of me. I ruined every single one of them. Uh, you know, uh, this is the kind of man that I was. Selfish, self-centered, prideful, all about me. Uh, if I didn't like you, I'd soon smack you in the face, uh, than deal with you. I was a very, very brutal monster. Uh, I hung around a lot of real bad guys, uh, and I did a lot of a lot of bad things that I'm not proud of uh, at all in any shape or form. Uh, I lived the party life, I lived the rock and roll life, and I brought my kids up that way as well. Uh, I had three children, two different uh, women, three children. and uh, you know they, uh, my, my first wife, she was a Christian woman. Uh, okay. and she was, she got smart real quick because I was in my addiction through high school and she realized that she is my high school sweetheart, but we jumped out 
And then we, we got married, and uh, uh, we had a planned pregnancy. But, uh, you know, I, I, I lasted maybe two months, two months of trying to do right and do good, but I was never clean and sober. And uh, she realized this real quick, and she took off. Uh, I, I left with another woman, and she disappeared with my son. And that was the smartest thing that she could have ever done. And she raised him and, uh, and, and hid him from me. And uh, I am now able to uh, have conversation with him because I had to call him and, and tell him that, hey, your mom did the right thing. And uh, I will get into that. But, uh, yeah, I, I introduced my kids to drugs, the ones that I raised. I introduced them to drugs. I introduced them to dealing. I introduced them to, to partying and womanizing and bullying. And, you know, uh, I, I was nowhere near the father that I was supposed to be. Uh, I, I, I didn't plant any good seed, Conrad, at all. None. Uh, wherever I went, I left a wake of chaos. I did it on purpose. I terrorized women. Uh I, I I never beat on women, but I terrorized women. Uh, I was a very I'm a very I'm a big guy, and I used my size to dominate and my voice, uh, I, and I like to scare them. I, I used to I used to carry around a 12 gauge shotgun shell, and if I was standing in line, I would be all wired out of my mind, doped up, not myself at all. Uh, but I didn't know who myself was then. I, I would put a 12 gauge shotgun shell in my mouth and chew on it and stare at them, just to just to wow. just to freak them out and scare them. Um, you know, I got uh, I got named uh, in Conway County in Arkansas. They they called me Toucan. They started calling me Toucan, and believe it or not, it wasn't for drinking. Uh, I fought so much. I fought like that old movie uh, with Clint Eastwood, Every Which Way But Loose. Uh, I'd fight in parking lots for money. I'd go beat up people for money. I'd terrorize houses, bust in doors, and beat up people for money. But they called me Toucan. If I didn't knock you out with one punch, I'd knock you out with the second one. If one can't, two can. Uh, and I glamorized that, and I got it tattooed on my hand. And uh, uh, I, I lived that life of wanting to to terrorize people, to to really strike fear in everyone wherever I went. And uh, you know, I, I got my I got my kids started on drugs. I I actually introduced them to meth. Because if you're going to do drugs, you're going to do it with your dad because I want to make sure that you get the good stuff and you know what you're doing responsibly. Yeah, boy, the devil is a lie. Were you thinking about God at all during this time? I mean, he was, you, you hated God or you didn't believe there was a God or, or, or what? Yeah, I, I, I didn't believe that there was. I, I also, at the same time, hated him. If he did exist, uh, I felt I got the short end of the stick. Uh, at age 21, I found my biological family, and, and here's the, uh, uh, the generational curses. Here I am, 21 years old. I'm already doing meth, dealing meth like crazy, uh, drinking like a fish, doing anything that was put in front of me. I was not a guy that said no to anything. I was a buffet guy. You put it in front of me, I did it. Um and I found my biological family. And when I found them, I found my mother. She was on the run from the law for manufacturer of methamphetamine. First time I talked to her, she told me that. Then she told me my little brother, which I didn't know I had a little brother, was in the pen. He was in prison for manufacturer of methamphetamine. And that my little sister, I didn't know I had, was on the streets, pregnant, strung out, homeless, on methamphetamine. And I had an older sister that was uh, didn't know if she was a lesbian or not and was strung out on meth. Now, I was brought up in a family that had nothing to do with meth. There was no alcohol in the house. If there was... If there was a six-pack of beer in there, it'd be in there for a month. 
two months. My dad didn't drink. My mother didn't drink at all. My dad hardly ever had a beer. And, uh, but once again, there was no Jesus. There was no God. There was no word. And, um, so, uh, generational curses, uh, I am a billboard for that because how could I be so gravitated to it and I find my biological family and they're all strung out on it? Right. There, it. There's yeah. evidence. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I, what do you say? I mean, I've been in my rap sheet. <laughs> I, I've got a, I went to get a, a Twit card uh, to be able to work on the docs. And uh, when I went through my interview and they did their background check, the guy that actually did it was going paper over paper <laughs> over paper. And he, he he's looking at me funny, and I'm like, hey, it's all handled. Uh, I'm a two-time felon with a violent background, you know, and, and – uh, but I, I realized something, Conrad. I, I realized that God has a perfect plan, and, and and we don't realize it. We don't know it. We don't we don't understand it until we get to a point to where we can go. Oh, I get it. And yeah, you see it later. You see it later. And uh, that's exactly what he's done. He let me live the life I did. 34 years of addiction, of womanizing, bullying, you know, kicking in doors, taking money, stealing, robbing, thieving, dealing dope, womanizing, just being, uh, I was completely out of control. So that way I could be out here now doing what I'm doing, having common ground to be able to reach out to those who are struggling or in, uh, and in the same storms. That's very important. Now, let's talk about um, your transformation. How did you go from that to where you are now? What happened? <laughs> what happened so, to change everything? Yeah. Um, you know, when, when he comes and he starts knocking, you're going to hear it one way or another when he starts calling you. There is no doubt in my mind that, that I, I really feel that God's up there and that it's like, it's just one big orchestra, and he's doing this, and he goes, oh, and now we're going to do some big gym. And, and he starts knocking at your door. And that's how it happened. I, I, it was in June of 2015. I was laying on the couch, beer cans everywhere, just getting drunk. And I was by myself watching TV. I think it was a Sunday or Saturday or something. It was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I heard a at my door. And uh, I actually got up and went and answered the door, and there was no one there. But at that same time, something come across TV. It was like, you need Jesus, or God is the answer. It was something like that. And then I noticed, and, and this went on every time I was on that couch. That door would knock. And I got up and ran a couple of times to the door. It was so, I heard a knock. And um, there was no one there, but there was always something on television about God, about Jesus, about salvation, about uh, recovery, about getting right, getting sober. And uh, it was so, so, uh, it was so annoying. I want to say that. It was annoying. And it was getting more and more annoying to the point of in September, September 13th, I, fine, fine. You want me to go to church, I'm going to go to church. Uh, the church is going to burn, but if you want me, if you're going to leave me alone, I'll go to church. And and that's how it was. I, that's I, one way to get there. <laughs> I, I mean, it was that obnoxious. And uh, so I went to my employer, uh, Miss Greta. She is an 81, 81-year-old 81 lady, uh, owned a gas station with a food store inside and all that. And I went to her and I said, Miss Greta, uh, uh, i, I, I got to go to church. And she goes, it's about time. It's about time. And she goes, I, I got a church. I'll take you. It it was her husband's church. I didn't know that Mr. Tim was Pastor Tim, and he had been pastoring a church for 50 years. And uh, this is a church that he built. So she took me to that church, 
and uh, it was kind of a charismatic church, and uh, uh, they, they do altar call, and she's like, come on, you need to go up there, come on. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, and she grabs me by the arm, takes me up there, and they start laying hands on me and praying over me, and I supposedly got saved. No, no, I didn't. Uh, the very next day, I was back in the bar, dealing dope, drinking like a fish. Uh, you know, when you get saved, it, it, it's got to it, it's got to be right here. When you let Christ into your life, it, it's got to be here. You can, there's not one single person that can pull you up and and make you get saved. You you have to want a whole new life. You have to have want mm. something different in your life. You there's a void in your heart. There's a void in your life that you want to be filled because it hurts. Uh, so uh, I didn't get saved. Exactly a month to the day later, 30 days later, I had my first psychotic blackout. And when I mean blackout, I mean total, absolute, out of control, uh, no holds barred. I went crazy. Um, from what everyone tells me, I don't remember anything. Uh, I did absolutely every drug that I could get my hands on that day. I started drinking at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, I did everything, meth, cocaine, crack, pills, uh, you name it. I did it. Uh, and at one thirty in the morning, I came home to my live in girlfriend and her daughter with a baseball bat and I, and I was going after them. Thank God no one got hurt, uh, no one went to jail, uh, and God, it seems, turned that bat into a rubber hose because the only thing I hurt was myself. Uh, the next day, the, the trailer hood came and did an intervention on me and told me everything I did, and I put myself in detox. I knew I was out of control, and uh, I, I knew I had to do something. I had to get my mind right because I had I had to have control. I had to have control. Once again, that that's so not true. Um, you can't. You, you have no control. You need to let go. You need to be out of control, but in the right way, with letting God have all the control. And uh, so I went into detox. Three days. They normally keep everyone there for three days. They kept me for seven. Uh, the doctor showed me my charts, which were. Basically, uh, I should be dead, and I was dying, and I didn't have long to live if I didn't change my life. Uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, he said these numbers. See all these numbers? None of them are supposed to be there. You're supposed to be dead. Uh, so I. God has a plan, uh, man. God has a plan. He's got a plan, brother. And so I started. He said, if you leave here and you don't go right into recovery and get some help, uh, you're going to be dead in no time. And so I, um, I went ahead and I started calling around. And I, every place that I called would not accept me because, number one, I have a, I'm a two-time felon. Number two, I don't have insurance. Number three, I don't have $30,000 for 30 days. Wow. No one. That's a lot of money, brother. Wow. $30,000 for 30 days, period. And that's what's going on in America right now. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> Don't get me on that ride yet. But, right. but uh, so the only place I, I ended up uh, calling the Panama City Rescue Mission, and they had a free faith-based recovery program. And... Uh, when I when I got out of detox, I didn't hesitate. I went immediately there and had an interview with the with John Goldman, and uh, I I was already I was already rebelling. Here I am reaching out for help for free, and I'm already rebelling by telling them I don't need the Bible, I don't need Jesus, I don't need God, I don't need any of your religion. Just teach me how to live a clean and sober life. That's all I want from this place. And John, he's like, well, and to be able to have that, you need Jesus. You're going to learn the Bible. And, <laughs> you know, and, um, and they almost didn't let me in 
because I was telling them how the program was going to work for me instead of how I'm going to work with the program. And right. um, But they did. They took a chance on me. And uh, when they took a chance on me, everyone hated me, and I hated everyone, and I was perfectly fine with that. I did not like anyone in there. And I made it perfectly clear that I liked none of them. I didn't want to be friends with anyone. Uh, I was... I I was a beast. I was an animal. I was not a nice guy. And but I knew I needed help. And I only wanted to do this one time. And uh 2 weeks into the program, you know when anyone has that moment with God, I call it the road to Damascus moment. Right. Amen. I call it that spiritual awakening, that aha, uh -huh, that did that really just, did this just really happen? You know, that moment where you all of a sudden realize that everything you thought was a lie is all the truth. And uh, that happened to me loud and clear because God does have a plan. He's still got things going on with me that I have. I just let him run with me now. I, have, I don't even fight nothing anymore. Um, he, he, I was outside in the back on the picnic table smoking a cigarette. And uh, two weeks into this, it was on Halloween 2015. And... He, uh, I, I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette, just watching people walk by, looking over, looking the bay and a lagoon right there going, beautiful day going, why am I in here? I don't need to be in here. I can walk out anytime I want. Why am I still here? I hate this place. I hate people. Why am I here? And then all of a sudden, he spoke to me audibly out of nowhere. And it wasn't this. For thy son, listen to it, me, for I am God. No, it was none of that. It was, hey, I want you to quit smoking. Uh, That's interesting. I know. It freaked me out. I jumped up off the park bench, and I started, I started cussing him. I started going pacing, cussing him, screaming at him, yelling at him, telling him, you've taken everything from me. You've taken my booze. You've taken my dope. You've taken my home. You've taken everything from me. You are not going to take my cigarettes. I started arguing with him, but I was cussing him. And uh, he spoke to me again, and he said, don't worry about the craving. I'll take care of the craving. And I went, no, 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 no. You know what? You're going to have to bury me with this because I'm going to die with one of these in my mouth. And he put the first scripture in my head. Ye of little faith. Simple, easy to understand, and it got my attention because that, to me, was a challenge. And Big Jim doesn't back down from a challenge. Uh, I I'm, I was that kind of a guy, and so I I froze, and everyone had been backing up. They were they were backing away from me, going, "Hey, I told you the big guy's gonna blow. Here he goes. Watch, he's freaking out." <laughs> yeah. And uh, I I I froze when when he said that to me, and I was like, "All right, you, you're challenging me. Watch this." And I walked over to a guy named Sean Means, and I gave him my cigarettes and my lighter. And I said, and I laughed. I said, hey, God just told me to quit smoking. I'll see you in an hour for a cigarette. And I walked away. I never had a cigarette that night. And I woke up the next morning, and the first thing on my mind is, yep, I'm going to want a cigarette anytime. I'm going to want a cigarette. i got to go find Sean. An hour later, I'm going, yep, anytime I'm going to want a cigarette. Anytime. An hour later... I'm at the glass doors looking at everyone out there on break smoking a cigarette going, I don't want a cigarette. I don't even want to be out there. Hey, this is Daryl. How you doing, buddy? Glad you're here, bud. And uh, That's called deliverance, brother. That's deliverance. That is a miracle. That is a miracle because yeah. what happened there, and that's my road to Damascus. That's that's when he took me 
and he had to do a miracle in me to show me that he's real, that he's serious, that he's in charge, and that if I would just shut my mouth for just a little while and listen to what he's got to say, my life can change for the good. No. And I was like, wow, okay, you just did overnight what Chantix couldn't do, what Wellbutrin couldn't do, what chewing gum, the patch, any of that stuff couldn't, what I couldn't do. Amen. And so that was, praise God, the, praise God because he, 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 it's like with Paul, he got his attention, he got his attention on the road. Then he blinded him. Then he had to put him over here where he had to think about it. Well, I was had to think about it for a couple of weeks, and then he did the miracle on him. Guess what? I'm sending you somebody. I'm going to send you to him. He's going to go ahead, and he's going to take care of you. He's going to get you. He's going to get your sight back. And he did that. That was my road to Damascus. So now he's got my attention, so I go to uh uh, John Goldman, I said, uh, uh, hey, hey, John, you got an extra Bible? <laughs> uh, and uh, he goes, yeah, here you go. So I, I go and I start reading. But two days later, I go to Pastor Mitchell, which he's the chief operating officer there. I go to Pastor Mitchell, and I throw that Bible at him. I said, you can take that Bible that ain't got nothing to do with me. That's nothing. I don't want nothing to do with it. That has nothing to do with me. Right now. He goes, where'd you start reading? I said, Genesis, the beginning? He goes, you're doing it all wrong. He goes, why don't you start at Matthew and learn about the guy named Jesus Christ that saved the world. It gives everyone an opportunity to save their life, to save their soul and have eternal life with him. Why don't you read about Jesus and read about all the good stuff that he did? And so that's what I did. I started reading Matthew, and I read Matthew over and over and over again. And uh, November 29, 2015, I went forward in front of 4,000 people crying for the first time in my adult life, sobbing like a child. Uh, like I've never cried so hard before and went forward and asked, and asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and take over. And uh, on uh, December 13th, I went forward and got baptized. And uh, then God had another aha moment with me. He had to do another one. Uh, so I, I'm in this program, and the way the program works is it goes from seven men to four men to three men to two men in, in the bedrooms. A seven-man room, oh, okay. a four-man room, a three-man room, and a two-man room. And um, so it was right after the smoking thing. All of a sudden, I moved into a two-man room. I bypassed 14 men. That takes about four months for those rooms to come available. All of a sudden, I, I, well, I'm going to say uh, they, they had something up their sleeve. They put me in the room with the house manager. Uh, he was the... Um, he was in the in the recovery program, but he was in there the longest. He had the most seniority. Uh, he was uh, uh, someone you could go to as a peer to be able to have conversation with. He was working his program well. His name was Alex Peters. Um, they put me because he's a professional wrestler. So here we got my machismo from the streets with his machismo from the ring. The only thing is, is they played a practical joke because Alex was a midget. Alex was a midget wrestler. And okay. they put the biggest guy in the program, in Ruman, with the littlest guy. And so they called us the twins. They called us, you know, Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger, the twins. And, and, yeah, I remember that movie. Yeah. And but Alex was absolutely amazing. When I walked into that room for the first time, me and Alex never talked. I walked in there. He's standing there waiting for me when I come in like a drill instructor. 
And I walked in, and, and he looks up at me, and he goes, let me tell you something here, buddy. You're going to read the Bible. You're going to learn about Jesus. We're going to have devotionals every morning. We're going to pray together. Do you understand this? We are going to work together on salvation. If you don't like it, get out. No, like, you're so cute, little fella. You're so sweet. <laughs> uh, Alex became my best friend, and he was one of the reasons. Uh, he, he was a very influential person in my uh, relationship and my walk to Christ, and he was absolutely awesome. And the aha moment that came behind that was uh, Alex, uh, three weeks before he was to graduate, he relapsed. He was in there for pain pills because of being in the wrestling his whole life. Uh, he was addicted to pain pills, and he relapsed while we was in there. And then uh, three weeks, uh, when he relapsed, they gave him an option to go back six months, uh, lose all his rights, his house manager rights, his all his rights, and go back and redo for six months, or he had to leave the program. Well, he chose to leave the program. And... Um, with uh, him making that choice three weeks later, he uh, overdosed. And, oh, my. And uh, I ended up staying in the hospital. John Goldman come and got me. I got real close with the family real fast. Uh, and uh, I went and spent five days in the hospital. And all it, because Alex was kind of a high-profile case, all the doctors come in and said, hey, you know, uh, they all had to agree. The only thing was keeping him alive was the brain stem. And, uh, and you know, Alex, devout Christian, brought, born and raised Pentecostal. Uh, and Mama right there said, you know, uh, well, we're going to let God take care of this. Let's go ahead and take him off the machine. And so I walk with Mama down to the uh, down to the hospice room, and uh, uh, you know they wheel Alex in there, and all the doctors and nurses are in there, and Mama goes in there, and, and Alex's fiance Angela and his sister Beth, and I'm out in the hallway, and I'm just, I just I I I just uh, how do you yeah, I, I don't know how to describe the feeling of what I was feeling in the hallway of of not believing that this was happening, that Alex mm -hmm. is, is, is going to be dead here in just a few minutes. Uh, how do you describe mm -hmm. that numbness? That uh, and I still don't know how to describe it, but uh, I'm standing in the hallways and, and I'm praying and I'm just in disbelief, just having conversation with my father, and you know, and just like wow. And the doctors and the nurses come out, and I'm like, well, there it is, you know, it's happening right now. And all of a sudden, the door swings open, and Mama comes out. And Mama's not small. Mama's not a little midget. Mama's big Mama. And Mama come out, and she snatched me up right here, and she pulled me in that room, and she put me alongside the bed, and she walked around to the head of the bed. She sat down, and Angela was in the middle, and Beth was at the foot of the bed. And I'm on the one side, and Alex is going through the process, the shallow, short and shallow, and he's going through the process. And Mama's saying a prayer, and I'm just looking at Alex, and I'm looking at everyone else. And I've never been through a situation. I didn't even go through that with my mother when she passed. I, I, you know, it's just something I didn't want to do. But Alex is going through it, and Mama's praying, and all of a sudden she stops. She looks up at me, and she goes, now you pray for him. And I had to pray over my best friend, my first clean and sober and Christ-like great friend, my roommate. And I, I had to pray over him as he took his last breath. Mm. And that's when I realized that everything is used for the good and the glory of God. Everything. Absolutely everything. I totally believe that. Because this is what I believe God did. I knew the beginning process of addiction through my life. I knew the middle process, how I ruined my life and so many others' lives. 
uh, through my addiction, how many people I hurt and stole and, and did all that stuff to. But the one thing I didn't know was the end result, which is death. And uh, God had to show me that. And at the same time, Conrad, you know what he did? He gave me my intended purpose in life. That's okay. That's when he. So he's turning it around during all that during all that pain and suffering. He's planting a seed. Yeah, oh, absolutely. There is no doubt about it. I one thousand percent believe that that right there, then and there, when Alex was dead, and I said my goodbyes and I walked out. Mm. That's when the fire was lit underneath me. I knew right then and there that I did not ever want to go back to doing, living the life that I lived. I, I never wanted, I did not want to die that way, needlessly. But more importantly, I never wanted to see anyone else ever have to go through that themselves, go through overdose, or as I watched Mama and the fiance and the sister, I never want to see a parent or a loved one have to go through that. And that's when God gave me my assignment that I am going to put on the armor, that I'm going to be anointed with a holy boldness, that down the road I found that I would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Down the road, this walk and everything that was going on, it was all orchestrated by God himself. To be able to to put me in faith boot camp with him. And let me tell you something, Conrad. My life is so, so different. I Change is not from the outside. It is from the inside. Amen. And it has to happen in a way that makes you go... I don't want a cigarette because it will make my father frown. I don't want to do dope or do wrong or sin because I don't want him to go, the day that I meet him, I don't want him to go, hey, man, do you remember that time that I told you don't do that? Why did you do it? Hold on. Oh. <laughs> We're having technical. So while he's turning on the light, we're with Big Jim from BigJimsWalk.com. He's talking about his testimony, 34 years of addiction. He was an abuser. He just uh, just went through the session of where his best friend, his best sober friend, died, and that's inspiring him uh, to to do what he's what we're about to talk about next. But keep keep going, Jim. Now that we got the lights back on, let there be light. Amen, the lights on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, um, you know, you've got to have, I, I don't want to do, I don't want to be anything like the person I was. I don't want to, I, I, I've got, even though I know my sins have been forgiven, First uh, John one nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will Amen. forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. I knew through my tears that the healing begun. Right. And uh, man, the, when, let me tell you something. He is the greatest planner of all times because He's going to put you through storms to be able to get you to the calm waters. He's got to put you through misery to be able to receive the miracles. There are things that you've got to go through when you're transforming and changing your entire life. You've got to go through inside. There's not an organ, that, there's not a spiritual organ that the doctors can cut open and get in there and fix up and do this. Okay, you're spiritually better. No. You have to go through pain. You have to face pain. You've got to deal with the pain because through the pain comes the healing. That's why That's why they. Uh, Jesus loves a broken down, a broken heart because he wants to be, he wants to be the potter. He wants to shape you back if you let him. He wants to mold that clay. He wants to get you back where you're intended where he intended you to be 
but you have to go through the things, the, the things in life. And, boy, I do, after Alex, I dove into the Bible. I dove into the Word. I dove into the spiritual. I dove in, and as well, the Panama City Rescue Mission, as well, um, found favor in me and let me through healing. They let me through, take some college courses online. Uh, I was the only one allowed to do that uh, in, in uh, Christian college courses, uh, uh, faith-based on lay counseling, and as well as uh, uh, addiction recovery uh, through, uh, through the Bible, through the Word. It, wasn't, it isn't secular at all. So I, was, uh, I did really well with that, and um, I was gaining a lot of weight in the program, and I started praying, uh, hey, can you help me out here with this? I need to start losing weight. I'm almost 300 pounds. And uh, he woke me up one morning at 4.30 in the morning, and this is at a time where I was learning surrender. Uh, Whatever it was, if it was good, it's God, and I'm going to do it, no matter what it is. I'm not going to question it. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to step out on faith. And do it because he might have a reason behind it. It may not affect me, but it might affect a hundred people out there. So uh, he woke me up at four thirty in the morning one morning and said, "Get up and go for a walk." I'm like, uh, "It's four thirty in the morning, man. It's I, you know, I know. Get up and go for a walk." And I was at a point in my program to where I could go out for an hour a day by myself. And uh, unsupervised. So, okay, okay, we're going to do this. So I started walking five miles every day. It took me about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes. And um, what I didn't realize is that God, there's Pastor Mitchell on there right now. How you doing, Pastor Mitchell? Uh, God was using that Right there, that walk. He turned that morning walk into my war room. There's only three things that I heard, my breath, my footsteps, and his voice. And we had conversation every morning in the dark, and I got to see the sun rise as I walked back. So it was, I learned how to be able to have conversation with my father. I learned how to be able to just let him have everything and 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 continually strengthen my relationship with him. And uh but there's something else that I didn't realize. He had me in training. He had me in training for a walk that I would never have thought that I would go on. A yep. a walk Amen. across America. So you guys are wondering why I'm on the why I'm having an interview with Big Jim from Big Jim's Walk. Well we've just been talking about how he's been in addiction for 34 years, um, and he had a, a, a blackout that he'd never had before he lost control. He went to rehab. He lost his best friend, his sober best friend, and this inspired him to walk. So tell us about the walk, man. Big well, um, let me tell you something. <laughs> Once again, uh, he, God is amazing on how he gets everything rolling and how he orchestrates everything. And I promise you out there, for those who are listening, that if you just learn to just do this and just shut up and listen, he's going to speak to you and he's going to lead you. And he's going to guide you, and he's going to direct you. And it may not be something that you want to do. But if you step out on faith, blessings will rain down. Uh, So for uh, almost 10 months, 9, 10 months, I walked five miles a day. And things started happening. Things started rolling. I don't know how, but a a company called Blue Diamond Media uh, found out about uh, uh, me and my testimony with Alex and and walking, and they wanted to uh, make a movie, a documentary movie of me walking out. And they wanted to, uh, um, and they had sponsorship from Netflix. I mean, they were connected, and I'm like, yes, awesome! We're going to do a 
Look at me, your movie about me. Yeah. So I'm going to make this story real short. Um, uh, it goes on for a few months, uh, but there's things that start happening. Failed movie, uh, failed filming schedule, failed uh, photo shoots, failed investors in, investors out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm walking to, uh, to work uh, one morning. Uh, this is where I'm able to work now while I'm still in the program. And I'm having conversation with my daddy. I'm having conversation with my father. And I'm like, you know, I'm doing everything right on my end. I'm doing everything here, and everything's working out. Why is this movie, why are they having so many problems? And he spoke to me, and he said, where am I in it? Wow. And he made me think about that all day long. And when I got back, and, and Pastor Mitchell, he's the one I, I went to after I did this, when I got back from work that day, I, I called uh, Lisa Robinson of Blue Diamond Media, the the producer, and, and I told her, I said, you know, we're not going to make this movie. And she's like, Jim, Jim, this is how Hollywood is. This is how it is. It's always last minute, rush, 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 blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you know what? God doesn't need a movie to get his story out. Amen. And so I, I canceled the movie, and, and Pastor, I went to Pastor Mitchell. I said, did I make a good choice? And he goes, you made the best choice you could have ever made. Because it's not about you, Jim. It's not about you, Jim. Uh, <laughs> Amen. And I was like, you are so, wow. so right. It's not about me. And, and that's how God worked on this. And so February 1st, 2000, and 17, I walked out the front doors of the Panama City Rescue Mission, a graduate of the program. And I graduated December 4th, but they let me stay there until February 1st. And I walked out the front doors. The media caught a hold of this. They were all over it. I was on outdoor shows and everything before. Got a lot, a lot of social media uh, stuff. I, I, I'm thousands of followers and I was like wow Jim this ain't about you this ain't about you and uh, I took off walking and I told Pastor Mitchell I said you know if we if this helps one person this walk then it's well worth it he goes you're right one person that's all it takes did you have anything planned at this point I, mean, what <laughs> I had everything planned that's the problem I had everything planned. Okay. So I'm walking out the rescue mission. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to road walk all the way to North Georgia, get on the Appalachian Trail, and I'm going to do the Appalachian Trail. Then I'm going to get off of the trail at the end of Mount Katahdin, and I'm going to walk the rest of the way all the way to Canada. And uh, that was the plan. The plan was that way forever. But, uh, you know, God has, he, he gets his way. The Father gets his way. And if your plan ain't with his plan, he's going to get you in alignment with his plan. If he's the one that gave you the purpose and the assignment, and you start going off kilter, he's going to let you know. It's just like uh, being a father for your children. If your children are getting out of line, you scold them, and you get them back in line, and, and you get them right where they need to be. Well, I'm hard-headed, and he knows it. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I got out of alignment, and he had to bring me back in. And uh, I, the idea was I was going to be on the trail. I'm going to be the only one in my family to ever do anything like this, that I'm going to walk. There was 4.5 million people on the Appalachian Trail in 2015. Only 978 completed it uh, through, through hike. Uh, it is a grueling, grueling backpacking adventure. Grueling. Uh, well, God had another plan. And, and, and so what happened is uh, I got to North Tennessee on the Appalachian Trail, and I get a message from some high school kids that have a faith-based group that uh, want to walk across their county carrying the cross, and they want me to lead them to bring a, the message of hope in Jesus Christ and bring awareness to addiction in their high school. 
but the high school wouldn't sponsor them because they're faith based. Uh, you know, it's three hours away, and how could I say no? I couldn't say no. So uh, my wife is on the trail with me now. She's in the vehicle going ahead, taking care of everything. She is handling absolutely everything. I'm walking and talking. She's doing all the hard work. <laughs> uh, I, I, see, I, I skipped all that. We got rid of our house. We got rid of the vehicles. We got rid of all the furniture. We got rid of everything. God got a hold of her three weeks as I was into this and said, why are you out here? You need to be with him. Amen. And so we, we did. She got rid of everything and come out here, uh, and now she's out with me, but not with me because I'm four or five days alone on the trail, and then we'd meet up. And I'd do the trail for three, four days, and then we'd meet up. So she's out here ministering and doing everything while I'm walking the trail and ministering and thinking that I'm doing something, and then really I wasn't. I was doing it all for me. But So I get off of the trail. We go back. We walk with these kids across their county, Ray County, Tennessee, 21 miles. If you've not walked 21 miles and you're not prepared to walk 21 miles, 21 miles will hurt you. It is not easy to do. But these kids did it. I was so proud of them. They didn't let go of that cross. They carried it all the way. And when we got wow. and when we got done, they handed me the cross and they said, "Now you carry it the rest of the way." Whoa! Yeah! Wow! Yeah! <laughs> Strong. And uh, so we stayed with the family. We stayed with one of the families that night. We went to church with them on Sunday. Sunday night, Grandma comes down with a bag of pennies. Now, they didn't know that this is summertime now, so donations were slow to come in. We were down, Monty and I were down to $12.78. And uh, we didn't tell anyone. We didn't let no one know. Uh, God gave me the vision. It's his job to provide. And, uh, and, and, I'm learning, I'm still, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to have that faith, I'm trying to not have trust issues, but I'm freaking out. We got $12.78, and, yeah. and Grandma comes down with this big Ziploc bag full of pennies, and she said, the Lord just spoke to me and told me to give the seed to the seed sower. These are my pennies from heaven. I've been picking them up off, off the ground for a long time. And I, I need to give you these. I'm like looking at this big monster bag of pennies, and I'm like, yes, we can get back up on the trail. That night, God spoke to me and said, I don't want you to go back up on the trail. I'm like, what do you mean? That's the plan. I need to go on the trail. He goes, oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. You want to do the trail for your trophy. I need you out here to be my trophy. Uh, oh, okay. wow. So now I'm mad. Now I, I, I'm mad again. I'm mad at him. I'm mad at him. He's not. He's not cruising with my plan. So that next morning, that Monday morning, we got twelve dollars and seventy-eight cents. A big bag of pennies. We go cash it in. It's ten dollars and nine cents worth of pennies. That's a lot of pennies, though. That's a lot of pennies, <laughs> but still, you know. And I, I was thinking it was more like a hundred dollars, and it was ten dollars and nine cents, and I'm. Absolutely livid. I'm mad at God. I'm mad at my father. I'm mad at the walk. I'm mad at people giving up. I'm mad. At, I'm just mad that donations aren't coming in. I'm mad at my wife because she's not as mad as me. I'm mad. I'm livid. And she snatches me up in front of this in this parking lot and she goes, "Hey, let's pray." That's a good idea. Um, <laughs> uh, and we start praying. Right there in the parking lot. Right just standing still, blocking traffic. And all of a sudden she goes, I know what to do. I know what to do. And we went down to a wholesaler, a vegetable wholesaler, a produce wholesaler right down the street. And we bought a case of tomatoes, went on the side of the road, sold them like that. Went back the next day. We stayed in Walmart parking lot. We went back the next day. Got three cases of tomatoes and a case of corn. Sold it like that that day on the side of the road. Went, what? Went back the next day. God, God was with us. Like there was, he said, you have faith in me, I'm going to rain them down on you. 
We went back. That wholesaler, for some reason, loaded us up. I mean, we could not put another grape in that Suburban. We had watermelons, cantaloupes, yellow canary melons. We had tomatoes, corn, green grapes, red grapes, yellow squash, green squash. You name it, peaches, apples, oranges. We had everything. We went on the side of the road, sold it all like that. In three days, we had over $400. Wow. And that was a strong lesson about just have faith in me. It ain't about your time. It's about my time. And it was miracle after miracle after miracle until we got... So instead of doing the Appalachian Trail, I'm now on the road. I'm walking the road. Totally different. The road is unforgiving. Uh, the Appalachian Trail, it is very soft and spongy. The road, it's concrete. It's black highway. It's semi-trucks. It's vehicles. It's horrible. It was ridiculous. And um, we got to Baltimore. And uh, wait a minute, you got all the way to Baltimore, walking on the road. Wow, that's that's far, brother. Yeah, <laughs> that's far. Yeah, <laughs> and we walked all the way to Baltimore, and and we just kept walking, and and donations were coming in, and people would be praising. We were saving people on the side of the road. The whole game changed. Everything. Walking the people to Christ, getting them in recovery. I had parents that were following me on Facebook that were finding out where I'm at, bringing their children, their 18, 19, 20-year-old kids, for me to be able to talk to them and testify to them right there on the side of the road. And hey Amen. I see on your blog here on BigJimsWalk.com testimonies. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, brother. I've got over 200 testimonies of people that were yeah. saved, that were delivered, yeah. that were uh, that had gone through the storms. It's not a light bulb that's going to give you hope. It's not a doorknob that's going to give you hope. The only hope is Jesus Christ. And every one of those testimonies that are on there uh, uh, absolutely testify to the amazing grace mercy and love of Jesus Christ that delivered them from their addictions. Amen. But uh, so I get invited to go to this church in Baltimore uh, to just to go check it out. It's a young church. We get in there, the, the, but they're growing so fast. They grew out of their building and now they're in a brand new big school auditorium. Super fancy, super high dollar auditorium, stadium seating, just gorgeous. And yeah, yeah, and that's a young pastor, 29 years old. The service is pretty decent. Got a little meat, got a little milk, pretty nice. And um, we we go through the service, and we're like, okay, cool. And I carried my cross with me wherever I went. When I went into church, I carried the cross with me into church. And uh, wow. so. We we were we were getting up to leave, and one of the ushers said, "Hey, the pastor would like to speak to you down front." And that's normal for me. They'll be like, "The pastor wants to know why are you carrying a cross? What's going on with you? Let me hear your story." And then they would, um, uh, you know, normally invite for me to come and testify. And uh, this pastor comes up, and he and uh, he meets uh, he comes up and he meets me, but he brings a big bumpy muscular bodyguard. My wife, Marty's coming in. She just got out of Bible study. <laughs> mm. And um, and he goes, so how'd you like the service? I said, uh, yeah, the service was good, Pastor. You did a good job. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. He goes, well, you know, we've got a lot of people that are following you here, and they've spoke to me about you. Um, and I think it's wonderful what you're doing. He goes, but I, I have a request of you. And I said, uh, sure, what's that? He goes, I, 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 I'd prefer if you did not bring your cross into the church. And I went, oh, what? And he goes, yeah, yeah, you, you understand what I'm saying? I said, no, I don't. He goes, yeah, I don't want you to bring your cross. I want you to leave it outside. And I, and I went, oh, what? Why? He goes, and, and then it dawned on me, oh, we're in a government 
it's a school, it's a government building, they might have restrictions, you might have restrictions, and, you know, I didn't even think, he goes, oh, no, it's not because of that, this is a pastoral decision, I don't want the cross in my church. Wow. And I went, all right. And he goes, we have a lot of new members coming in every Sunday, and I don't want them to be frightened off by the, by the cross. And I went, oh, <laughs> and my wife, Maddie, here, she's, all, oh, I understand. This is a feel-good church that only wants to use the Bible to be able to make a buck. Let's get out of here. We don't belong here. Right. And... Um, um, so uh, we did, and 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 Conrad, that that's where I lost faith for the second time on this walk. I got mad again. The old gym was resurrected quickly. I was steaming mad. I was ridiculous mad. I was. Uh, how do you explain this? So, um, I I wanted to end the walk right there because I didn't understand why God would allow such an atrocity to happen. I didn't understand. I was mad that they didn't allow the cross. And then I was thinking about it. He never once said Jesus. There was not one single cross in that church service, and they did not do an altar call for salvation, an offer of salvation. Right. And so, There's a lot of that going on, man. I mean, that's that, the temperature of the church in America is really getting colder. It, you know, it's just... It, it's absolutely it's getting warm. <laughs> it's horrible. And, um, yeah. but, the, but, so we're driving, and thank, thank the Lord for my wife, because she's letting me vent, and I'm venting, and the old gym is out in full force. And I'm cussing, and I'm swearing, and I'm done with this walk, and I'm done with this, and I'm done with that. And she just keeps driving. And for two and a half hours, we drove. And I'm thinking that she's following the directions I gave her, which was to go down south. I'm done with this walk. But she didn't listen to that. She just drove. And we got to a place called Winchester, Virginia. And she said, look, we've got enough money. Let's just get a motel tonight. Let's pray about it. And we'll figure it out in the morning. And that's what we did. But I woke up in the morning. It was like it's like Jesus was just right on top of me when I opened up my eyes. I'm looking at him. <laughs> and it felt that way. And he's like, I didn't tell you to quit. Get up and go north. Uh, so I broke out my phone and I looked at my map. And directly north, 332 miles, Niagara Falls, the Canadian border. I'm like, what? The one thing I didn't know is, is that where we stopped is the beginning or the end of what they call the heroin highway. It's where all the heroin comes from Buffalo and from Baltimore and from New York. It all comes and funnels down to the south through that highway. That's where the opioid epidemic is the worst in the nation. God put me right where he needed me to be. And huh? What? Hi. Hi. No. And uh, they, we can't do this, honey. You think so? Mm -hmm. And uh, is that, can you hear me okay? You need to go shopping? No, I'm not going shopping. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Can hear you? Yeah. And um, we uh we started walking from there, and when I left that place four hours, one of my followers uh, called me four hours after I walked out of that town. That, that day, they were just then going through it. In three hours, they had 23 overdoses. What? Wow, that's a lot, brother. Oh, no, it, it gets worse. Smaller communities, try 40 as I went forward. Berkeley Springs. I was met in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia by grieving parents begging for help because there is nothing there. The churches aren't doing anything. The government's not doing anything. No one is doing anything in the small communities. That I couldn't believe that the churches are so closed off to thinking that they don't have to do anything because it doesn't affect their church. The mindset right now of the church body is uh, we're safe in these walls. This is our church. They have lost 
touch. Tell me about it, brother. They Tell have, me about it, Absolutely. Man. They have lost touch with the, the, the way. They've lost touch with the way. Go out. You, you, cannot, you cannot say that you are a saved Christian, that you have salvation when you're stepping over a person that needs help. Amen. And yeah, they're basically just they're basically it's come to the point that they're just trying to keep the doors open and keep it running. Um, that's what happening. Uh, Terry Beagle's from West Virginia. She can attest to the fact that drugs are really bad in that area. She's watching right now. Yeah. I, so this this what what happened uh, on that walk between uh, Virginia and in uh, Niagara Falls? That was the saddest part of the walk. Three hundred and thirty-two miles. It was the right. saddest. It was um, death upon death upon death upon communities without Jesus. Uh, churches, churches being sold. Uh, communities are are more invested in the idol on the idol of money than they are in their in their uh, the moral fabric of their family uh, bringing up kids right with with Christ bringing them up in the church um, there it is absolutely it's horrific I don't know how else to explain it uh, besides it's Satan's playground it is absolutely Satan's playground up there it's sad when you have entire towns that are shrinking not because of uh, job loss, not because of um, uh, homelessness or, 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 or the economy or anything like that. No, they're, they're shrinking because of the opioid death. The, the towns, are sh wow. towns are shriveling up and are going to be ghost towns because of the opioid epidemic. I was invited by Governor Wolf, Wolf of Pennsylvania to come and inaugurate uh, his new drug and alcohol program. And I use any, any platform whatsoever. If I'm given a platform to be able to scream Jesus Christ is the only way, the hope, the life, if I'm able to do that, I'm going to take it. And uh, Governor Wolf, uh, I sat right behind the podium, brother, with Big Jim's walk all over it. Big old cowboy hat. Everyone, I guarantee you, in Pennsylvania was going, who is that guy right there? So uh, it was amazing to be able to put, uh, to get Jesus uh, and this ministry on a, on a national level. And I need to give a shout-out as well to the Minnesota Recovery Network. They have found a way to bridge the gap between church and state, which is amazing. They're doing an incredible job up there being able to, and it is so faith-based recovery all over Minnesota. It is absolutely wonderful. I had the opportunity me, to go up there and speak for five days while I was on this walk, and I did a little speaking tour up there, and it was just wonderful and amazing what they're doing. Let me ask you a question here. At the beginning of this interview, you told me that you know one of the one of the opportunities was for you to spend thirty thousand dollars for thirty days through a secular rehab. Now you're going on this walk, and you see that. Uh, there's not many faith-based recovery. The churches are, are not really jumping up and down about this epidemic that we have up there on the East Coast. So you see a big, huge void where God needs to touch the earth in that in that area, and you you have a passion to solve that. I see here you've got Big Jim's Walks uh, Foundation, the Million Man Army, and, and Camp Redemption. What what is that all about? This walk was never about me. It, it, this walk is called. It started. It started out. Oh, look at it, Big Jim's walk. Big Jim's walk. Well, it ended up getting named that. Uh, and then, uh, as this thing, uh, as God evolved this, and 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 started teaching me more about what His plan was, 
And the more I was willing to accept it, this turned into a nonprofit organization now that has a board of directors of pastors, of, of uh, businessmen, businesswomen, of addiction counseling specialists. Uh, that all have the same, uh, that all believe the same thing. Number one, Jesus Christ is the one and only true uh, Son of God uh, and uh, is the only, only way to salvation, only way for hope. And um, they have, they, they believe in the vision that God made, gave me to build free recovery programs, but it isn't just for drug and alcohol. Okay, I want you to repeat that because you're, I want you to repeat that because you're going out a little bit. Uh, they gave you the ability to make free recovery programs? No, they believe in the vision that God gave me about building free recovery programs across this nation that aren't just faith-based. They are Jesus-based. Which is, it's a huge difference there, and right. um, they believe in the vision. They they love it. I I've been blessed with resources all over this nation now that are behind this when the time when God gives us the time. But the foundation it, it, it was about the walk. We went out. We made a ton of noise this year about the message in in Jesus Christ, the message of hope. The message of love. We made a ton of noise. We're nowhere near done yet. Uh, we have uh, the foundation is the umbrella. It is going to be the umbrella that's uh, going to uh, handle a bunch of a bunch of uh, other ministries. The Million Man Army is the campaign. The vision that God gave me was it's not going to be a it's not going to be the government that's going to be able to fund this. It's not going to be because the government just ain't going to do it because they want to try to take Jesus out of everything. They, right. It's not going to be corporate America because once their profits start going, the greed kicks in, and they're going to immediately take the funding out from anything. It's going to be individuals like you, like me, that believe in the foundational teachings of Jesus Christ to love and to help others. And uh, the Million Man Army is all about knowing your resources, taking a pledge, getting involved, and, and donating $5 a month to be able to build these free recovery programs. He wants his children to be a part of this. Not the world. He wants his children to be the example in this. And so the Million Man Army come together. Uh, we've got some donors on there that, that faithfully every month that automatically withdraws out of their out of their account, and uh, we're saving up money. And you know, hey, do we got a lot of money? No, we don't even have a thousand dollars saved up yet. But guess what? I, I'm not worried about it because he's the one that has the vision. He's the one that's in charge. He's the one that's got this going on. I'm not worried about it. And Camp Redemption is the actual recovery program. Uh, CAP stands for Christ Amplified Ministries and Programs. Camp Redemption is going to be a uh, large scale, 600 bed, 600 bed program, men and women. Uh, but more importantly, I, I'll get you this here in a second, uh, it, but it treats, it, it, it's about Look, Jesus Christ did not give you hand out applications for salvation. It's free. So why do all these programs out here want thirty thousand dollars application process, waiting time, and all this? We're not going to do this. If you need help over anything, drugs, alcohol, sex, porn, if, uh, 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 womanizing, if you uh, need spiritual recovery, depression, Jesus Christ can fix it all. He can handle it all. He can take care of everything. And, you know, if somebody comes to you for help, one of the biggest issues we have out here is they all say no. Or it's going to take two weeks to get you a bed. They die in, 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 in an instant because they get denied. Right. Because the addict wants immediate self-satisfaction. We want immediate response. 
so we need to change that. But the biggest vision that he gave me about Camp Redemption was we need to treat families. Um, normally, birds of a feather flock together. So if uh, it, it, a heroin addict is going to be married to a heroin addict, an alcoholic is going to be married to an alcoholic. Well, you're not going to have an alcoholic married to a heroin addict because they are they don't get along. They're, they're not under the same thing. So what the, the vision that I have that it was given to me was, why don't we take the entire family and be able to provide and offer a uh, a living space where they can recover together? Here's why. If you take one out to be able to get them help, the other one sit back still in their addiction, having to take care of the kids, the bills, and everything. Six months, nine months, a year later, this person comes back clean and sober into a dirty situation. Now there's animosity. Guess what we've done? We have now destroyed the marriage. Now we've separated the family because the person that was out here struggling hates that this one's clean and sober and has a whole new thing. Guess what? Those children, two years old, three years old, they know what mom and daddy's doing. They know exactly what's going on. So those kids, they need recovery as well. The husband needs recovery. The wife needs recovery. The kids need recovery. The family together needs recovery, and they can recover together. And now we're creating, now we're creating accountability. When the kids can look at mama and go, mama, you ain't supposed to do that. Daddy, you ain't supposed to do that. And the husband to be able to say, hey, we're not going to do this. Let's all get together. We can we can put those morals and we can put the values of the word of God into the family. So it's an idea we have about uh, building family recovery and offering that. And we'd be the only ones out there that do something like that that I know of. Amen. Kind of reminds me of the book of Acts. You know, they, they all live together and commune together as families, you know, um, that sounds like a Book of Acts type idea, man. I love the Book of Acts. It actually is my favorite book. Uh, you know, Paul, Paul, you know, he's my beast in the book, man. Paul was a beast, yeah. and he lived, you know, the dark side and then came over, saw the light, understood the light, accepted the light, and then he became a beast for the light. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone, we're on, we're on with Big Jim from BigJimsWalk.com. We talked about his 34-year struggle with addiction, um, how God brought him out of it. We talked about his walk. He ended up carrying the cross. He, he identified a problem, and now he's on a mission uh, for the Million Man Army and the Camp Redemption. So one of the ways that you can get the word out on this is just share this via social media. Get the word out. Follow Jim on Facebook and check out his um, BigJimsWalk.com, and you can see some of the testimonies over there. It's pretty inspiring. Jim, it's customary for um, to have the guests pray us out. Can you pray us out? Absolutely, brother? I can. I'd be honored Amen. to. Well, let's all bow our heads. Amen. You want to pray with me, baby? Yeah. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for for allowing this uh, this meeting to come together through the airwaves. Uh, Father God, I pray that my tongue was put to the side and that you were speaking through me, Father God, exactly to those people that showed up and that heard a little bit of this message. You orchestrated that, so there is something special for them. And I pray, Father God, that they receive whatever the message was for them exactly. Father God, I pray for Conrad, and I pray for, for his podcast to be able to continue on, to reach out, reach others, reach the least, the last, and the lost. Take no more and be able to, to take a stand and be able to stand proudly and be able to say, my Lord is Jesus Christ. Father God, this is, this is an exceptional time and because you are an exceptional God. And Father God, we thank you, we praise you, and we honor you. And we pray that we can continue to be the light for you. Father God, we love you, we honor you, and we glorify you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, I just want to say I was really inspired about how 
God and you had that walk. I mean, if you if you know that part in the book of Enoch, it says it didn't doesn't mention too much. It's not the book of Enoch. It's the book about Enoch in Genesis. Mm-hmm. It says uh, God took him. He walked with him. And, and that's cool. I used to go on prayer walks for hours. I, I can relate to that. I highly <laughs> recommend it. If anyone yeah. is able to get out there and walk and just have conversation and, and a, yeah. walking and conversation. It took me eight months to walk across America, four pairs of shoes. It, it, it was, uh, it was. You must have had a few blowouts. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was, uh, it was an absolutely amazing, uh, amazing adventure and, and, and the best assignment. And I'm so grateful that uh, that he loved me enough to choose me to do it, and it was amazing. Amen. And and uh, it, this is only the beginning, folks. This is only the beginning. Get on Big Jim's walk and check it out. We are going to. We got a property. We need everyone to pray for. We're praying on it. We got a bunch of prayer warriors out there that are praying for this property. It's an old juvenile detention camp. It's been up for sale for nine years in Virginia, and we're praying for it. It would be a wonderful beginning. Amen. All right, brother. Thanks for coming on ConradRocks.net. You guys can find this on the podcast. Be sure and share this wherever you're listening to this podcast or watching this video. See you later, Jim. God bless you, brother. Be good. Now, wasn't that awesome? For more testimonies for Jesus, you can check out the testimony label at ConradRocks.net. Now, you're going to find that a Testimonies have a lot in common. I find that God seems to meet us at our lowest points and at tragedies. It seems to be at those lowest points that we're more moldable, and he can really get our attention at those moments. The same is true here with Big Jim from BigJimsWalk.com. Now, you can follow him on Facebook. I'll put the link to his Facebook profile in the show notes. But just remember, BigJimsWalk.com. You can find everything about him there. You can get uh, speaking engagements. You can call Marisol. I'll have the phone number in the show notes. Just remember, BigJimsWalk.com. Now, also, remember to share this with your friends and family on social media because this is a message of hope, and we all need hope right now. I want to thank you for being in my life. Until we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher. Comrade Rocks.net